Um, okay, folks, this is uh, a legend of, of history standing here in front of you. Um, I would respect Tom more than any other historian uh, alive, to be honest with you. Uh, in the world today. No high praise, well deserved, Tom. Uh, this man here is uh, a man who has dedicated his life to history, who understands in a more deep fashion than any of us, any of us here what history is, is about and what happened in Limerick, in particular during the War of Independence. Okay? Tom, not only that, Tom interviewed some of the people who were there at the War of Independence. Yeah. And he would have spoken to these people that we just see as names today. Okay, so an incredibly important moment here for us for the next 40 minutes. It's a pity we, I could sit and listen to Tom for four hours, but 40 minutes is all you have. Let's enjoy this. Let's drink in the information we get from Tom. Okay? Um, Tom told me. Let's go. Okay. Hope I live up to that, lads. Um, I have a few notes here, so I'm going to just refer to the notes, keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, Start with the, in 19, November 1918, uh, there was a general election in Ireland. And out of nowhere, Sinn Féin, effectively out of nowhere, Sinn Féin swept polls. Now, it was a reaction to the executions of 1916. Now, of 105 seats to be filled, Sinn Féin filled 73. Um, the Irish Nationalist Party, which used to dominate Irish pa politics, they were wiped out. They were down to six seats, and the Unionists had 26. The only about the Unionists having 26 was the county with the second highest number of Unionist seats, believe it or not, was Dublin. There was four Unionist seats in Dublin. Now, two of them were artificial, they were in Trinity College. You know, that, that Trinity College had the right to elect two MPs. Anyhow, moving on. The, in January 1919, things got a bit heated. In Tipperary, a place called Salahead Beg, there was an ambush. Uh, eight men took part in the ambush and two policemen unfortunately were killed. Uh, a Constable MacDonnell and a Constable O'Connell. Now, Regardless of what people might think, the death of anyone, you know, uh, is a tragedy. Now, the two men that were killed, uh, O'Connell and uh, MacDonald. MacDonald was a widower with a big family. He was in his early 50s. He was in County Mayo. O'Connell was a single man from Coatsford in County Cork. But as I say, that ambush. Now, the ambush was uh, for... They were escorting a uh, cart carrying jelly knights to Salahid Bay Quarry. And the IRA um, ambushed them to capture the jelly knight. Now, the men involved in the ambush would have been Sean Tracy, Dan Breen, Shemus Robinson, Sean Hogan, um, Ty Crow, uh, Michael, Michael Ryan, um, Paddy O'Dwyer, and there was one other who I can't think of, right? Anyhow, um, that was the, the kick-off of the Irish War of Independence. The same day, ironically, in Dublin, the, uh, they all met for the first time. Now, uh, when Sinn Féin elected, had a lot of uh, 73 uh, TDs or MPs, whatever you want to call them, elected, they decided they were going to hold their own parliament. They weren't going up to over going to go over to Westminster, as they had pre as all uh, Irish Nationalist Party MPs had. Sinn Féin were going to set up their own parliament, their own government. And that, the first meeting was the same day as the Salahid Big ambush, right? Um, the next incident of note, now remember, it wasn't as if a war kicked off and they're shooting all over the place. There isn't. Um, if you went outside of Munster, you wouldn't know there was a war on. Uh, um, outside of Munster and Dublin, I would say you wouldn't know there, there was a, a war hmm. on. And even within Munster, there was only four counties. Uh, Tipperary, Cork, Limerick and Kerry. 
where the team was uh, uh, very aggressive. To a lesser extent, Clare, uh, possibly Longford and, and Dublin. That was it. I mean, people think of the Irish War of Independence and think they're shooting going on all the time. Of course, uh, there were very few actions. There were some counties, I think Leash and Offaly, I don't think there was only a handful of fatalities in those counties over a three year period. Anyway, as I say, mo moving on. Um, the main drivers of the ambush at Solhead Beg were Sean Tracy, Dan Breen, James Robinson, and Sean Hogan. Now, Hogan was a 19 year old, uh, a little bit, a bit of a helmet scale. And the four boys went to a dance at a place called The Lock, which is near Dundrum. And uh, after the dance, they were to go back to uh, a house, we say they, they were all to go back to a house um, uh, near, not too far from Dundrum, and as to know And um, Hogan, however, met a girl. Then there's so many girls, you know, even then. And he decided, take the agreement, he went off with the girl uh, 10 miles away on a bicycle. And um, they passed this house uh, where there was a policeman living. Now, the policeman, he was actually in company with two other girls as well. So there was three girls in Hogan. And uh, the police, they flashed this policeman's house and the policeman uh, uh, didn't know Hogan, but he knew two of the girls and they were from Star City Republican backgrounds. So he decided, um, uh, you know, that Hogan must be a Sinn Féin uh, activist or a Nairi member. And he went back to the barracks in, uh, in Glenbane and he reported what he'd seen. So the uh, sergeant at the, in the barracks, a sergeant Wallace, decided to raid uh, the matters of Enfield. That's where uh, they reckoned he was going. And sure enough, when they got the matters, to, uh, the matter girls ran in and told Fogel, get out, the police are coming. Now, <laughs> a man with a bit more intelligence would have said where are they coming from and gone off in the opposite direction but he didn't he rushed out uh, down the field and the four policemen are coming along on on the road and he's running down a field that's high above the road so they see him coming from a mile off and uh, just he jumps onto the road that they're waiting for him and he's arrested now he was taken first of all to, to Glendan and then he was taken to Torlis. <coughs> uh, meantime, Sean Tracy, Breen and Robinson uh, realised, you know, he wasn't where he should be. So uh, they got word that he'd been arrested. Now, they made plans then to, to rescue him. And the rescue took place at a place called Naklong. Many you would know who Naklong is. Um, the four, uh, only four, now, the three men realised that three was not enough. So they invoked some help from uh, fellows from Galbi. Now Galbi is about seven miles from that long. And they got four, five men from Galbi to give them assistance. And what they did was uh, they got four of the Galbi fellows to cycle tamely to get on the train, find out where in the train um, Hogan was situated oh, and, and his, his escort and when they got to knock long um, they mounted a rescue now uh, at knock long unfortunately two of the policemen were killed and Dan Green was seriously wounded but that kicked it off let's say uh, Hogan was taken then let's say back eventually back to West Limerick uh, where he was um, kept for uh, quite some time. Now, as I say, Breen had been seriously wounded, uh, Tracy less seriously wounded, but they were wounded, so they have to be taken um, uh, for cover. So I say that, that, that where they can be, um, where they can be uh, looked after. 
Let's say that was in uh, May 1919. Um, after that, the thing began to pick up, pick up momentum. Um, now, as I say, in 1919, the War of Independence really only affected a couple of counties. It affected East Limerick. Um, it affected, obviously, Tipperary, uh, to a less extent Cork, Dublin, and Dublin. That's effectively uh, where the thing uh, was in 1919. Um, but the momentum was building. Now, in 1920, the thing really kicked off in Ernest. In Limerick, the first significant uh, incident in uh, 1920 was an attack on Maroon Barracks. Now, I actually interviewed a man that took part in the ambush or at the attack on Maroon Barracks. And what he told me was very funny. Uh, there was a man brought in, an expert, brought in to set the mine to uh, blow out the back of the barracks and uh, to tamp the mine into place. They put um, a land roller, you know, some of you from uh, family background might know uh, stone land rollers, a big uh, heavy thing for rolling land. And the boys decided to put a stone land roller to tamp in the mine against the, the barrack wall. Uh, they, ran, they set the charge and ran back. There was a massive explosion. And when the dust cleared, there was a big scarf smack up the side of the barracks. And the stone roller was about two fields away in Bruce. You know, they didn't understand uh, how to set uh, um, mines or set bombs. Like, fortunately for the uh, people inside the barracks. Now, as I said, throughout 1920, there was a lot of barrack uh, attacks, um, particularly, as I say, in the four southern counties of Limerick, Cork, Tipperary. Um, in Limerick, there were two very successful barrack attacks. One at Barry Landers, <coughs> where the, the garrison were captured. And what happened to Barry Landers was that they broke into the house next door and they got up onto the roof of the barracks. And uh, once they were up on the roof of the barracks, unfortunately for the RIC, they were on, they were on a loser. And uh, the IRA forced the uh, garrison in the barracks of Barry Landers to uh, surrender. Now, that happened in April. 1920. In, at the end of May 1920, Kilmallock, RIC barracks, was attacked. Now, as you can imagine, Kilmallock would be a fairly big sized town, so the barracks is a fairly significant one. And the um, IRA destroyed the barracks, but they didn't manage to capture the garrison because there was a, 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 a reinforced shed out the back. And the RIC managed to escape out of the barracks uh, into the, this shed out, out the back. Now, two of the garrison in Kilmallock were killed. Uh, there was a sergeant and an RIC uh, man who said two were killed. Um, moving on. In March 1920, the first of the Black and Tans uh, came into Ireland. Now, the reason the Black and Tans were brought in was the RIC, the numbers were depleted. There hadn't been much recruitment during the First World War. And once things got a bit hot in Ireland, a lot of us resigned. Now, to be fair, it's very easy to say why they resigned. Well, they were under, their families were under pressure. Like if the local IRA said to, said to some new brothers in the RIC, can not get out of it? You know, in other words, the families were intimidated. A lot of the RIC men resigned. Now, the British government decided that they would um, uh, reinforce the RIC with recruits from England. Now, fellas, remember, in England after the war, there's a couple of hundred thousand unemployed ex-soldiers. They've given everything for, you know, for, for England, but England wouldn't give them too much for them. Uh, they're out of a job. So, police work in Ireland as far as they were concerned, was a daddle. So they joined up, a lot of them joined up. Now, in total, there was about 10,000 uh, Black and Tans recruited. Now, there's a lot said against them. But to be fair, 
the uh, young men that went to the trenches, they were brutalized by their experience in, in the trenches of the First World War. And um, uh, they weren't taught how to deal with uh, a civilian situation like they would meet in Ireland, with the result that they were, um, you know, uh, a lot of them did things they shouldn't have done. But in fairness, they were no worse than a lot of the RIC. And they certainly weren't worse than the auxiliaries. Now, I have to explain who the auxiliaries were. The British government decided to establish a kind of an elite force to combat the IRA. And that elite force consisted of ex-officers. Now, as I say, we were talking about ex-soldiers that, that were unemployed. There were also a huge uh, uh, number of ex-officers unemployed. So they formed the, the ex-officers into an elite corps, the auxiliaries. Now, some of you would have heard of the auxiliaries. Now, the auxiliaries, um, they were ruthless. They were much worse than the black and tans because uh, a lot of the auxiliaries had, um, they were officers, yes, but they had come up from the ranks <coughs> because what Britain found in the First World War was that um, they were running out of... Uh, uh, young officer corps. They had an awful lot of young officers, but they, you see, if you take, send a, a group over the, over the top and it, over the trenches, the first man up is the second lieutenant, probably. Now, the Germans know this, and they're going to target him with the result that the uh, uh, number of, of young officers killed in the First World War was no one's business. Because, as I say, the first man leading his troops. He's uh, an officer. He's shot. He's going to be the first person shot. Uh, with the result that they, they are... Caitlin Queen's they are, reception. Caitlin Queen. Uh, 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 as I say, they ran out of um, young officers. With the result that they were promoted from the ranks. And an awful lot of those were unemployable after the war. Because um, they didn't have the connections. And they ended up now uh, as members of a force called auxiliaries. Now... If you think black and tans were bad or were tough, these boys were something else. Anyhow, moving on. Um, to combat this, the IRA set up uh, what they called permanent active service units, known as flying columns. And the first flying column was set up in East Limerick. It was set up in East Limerick in the summer of 1920. And when you think about it, those fellows were on almost permanent um, uh, service. Now, a lot of counties didn't set up uh, flying columns until the summer of 1921. So, East Limerick was um, the head of us, you know, uh, it was the head of the posse in that sense. <laughs> um, the summer of 1920. A number of ambushes took place in Limerick. Now, uh, some of you might know where Grange is, uh, between Grange and Kilmallock, or Grange and Brough, um, near the Hamlet public house. But just before you come to the Hamlet, there's a very windy section of road with very high walls. And there was a, a big ambush there. But I really were lucky because they were expecting uh, an RIC convoy come from Limerick and instead of that a much bigger convoy came from the opposite direction coming from Fermoy. Uh, it was um, uh, Royal Air Force um, then being transferred from Fermoy to up to Galway and uh, what they were expecting, yeah they were expecting a convoy about two two lorries of um, black and tans. <laughs> they got ten convoy, ten lorries of, 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 of uh, 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 Royal Air Force men with an arm car, armored car. So to say, the IRA were very lucky to um, get out of the ambush at um, at uh, uh, Grange. Um, ambushes and uh, continued throughout the war with Venice. The biggest ambush, and uh, it's very rarely spoken about in terms of Crown Force fatalities, took place at Dunkeen in uh, February 1921 when 11 uh, Black and Tans and RIC men were killed 
Now, it is, there were only two ambushes in the whole of the War of Independence where the number of fatalities uh, went over when into double figures. Kilmichael, obviously, which is uh, much spoken about in Cork. But the second ambush uh, uh, was Drumkeen. There was 11 RIC in Black and Tans killed at Drumkeen. And um, the thing, the irony about Drumkeen is it was probably a better ambush than Kilmichael because none of the attackers were killed at Drumkeen. Now, the only, uh, the only, um, uh, Dare say the only injury they had was a fellow called Liam Hayes got his um, thumb and four, forefinger blown off by uh, a ricochet bullet, which I believe would have been fired by men from the other side of the road, and it was his own men. Um, like you ambush uh, a, 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 a lorry and there's so, uh, people on both sides firing at them. There's a danger that they might hit one on their own on the other side of the road. And I believe that that's what happened with, with Liam Hayes at Junkeen. Anyhow, he survived. He lost a, a thumb and a forefinger. Now, in later years, Hayes became head of the equitation school in, in Dublin. He set up the equitation school and um, uh, they were very uh, successful in shore jumping. And um, some of his family are still in County Limit today. <laughs> um, moving on. One of the, um, I'd say, I'd say, I use the word tragic events that happened, was a dance at a, a place called Cahal Gilmore. Now, your teacher, by the way, will tell you all about it, because he knows all about it. Um, Mr. Hayes, by the way, um, uh, we're doing commemoration for it. But essentially what happened was, the IRA wanted to, um, for the dance, collect money by guns and they organised a dance at an old gentleman's residence at Cahar Gilmore and about 200 turned up to the dance. Now they were warned sometime before that by uh, an RIC sergeant of Bluff, uh, Sergeant Fred McGarry. For God's sake lads, he went up to a house that was known to be uh, a Sinn Féin house. He said, for God's sake, let's just call, call off the dance. We know where it's on and it's going to be raided. Now, in fairness to the men organising the dance, he thought the raid would be a local raid by the local RIC. And they wouldn't have that many, they would have maybe 18 or 20 men. And he had sent to his house thinking he was going to repulse um, a raid from the local barracks. What happened was something totally different. Now, I interviewed a man back in the, uh, about 30 years ago, and he told me uh, uh, he lived at Taylor's Cross near Feathermore. Some of you might be from the Feathermore area, and he lived near the Taylor's Cross in Feathermore. And he said, 15 lorries passed up my house, he said, and they stopped at the Taylor's Cross. And all the men got out, there the drivers and a few, and a few guards, right? And they went off across country. Now, the whole thing around Cahagillamo was planned. They knew exactly what was going down. And about 150 uh, Black and Tans and RIC came out from Limerick and said to Taylor's Cross, there was more coming from Croom, there was more coming from Kilmallock, in addition to the ones from Bluff, and there was more coming from Palace Green. And when they dance, when they raided the dance, unfortunately, uh, five IRA men and one black and tan was killed. Now, as I say, uh, I don't care what your politics are, uh, uh, having young men killed in action, uh, it's, it's a tragedy. Um, moving on. Uh, in, the, in, in May 19, early May 1921, the IRA came on, in, uh, in Limerick came under serious pressure. The reason being, the longer you're out there, the more the British know about you, right? So, um, the, as I said, the, 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 track, the IRA were lured into a, a, an ambush at Strathaller. Now, where are Strathallers, as you? Strathaller is between Kilton and Indermick and uh, Kildare in Cork. And um, uh, there was four men killed there. 
Now, the following day, following day, uh, uh, 15 miles away. Now, the IRA retreated back that night. They got out of that one. Uh, the both of us killed, but the rest of them got away. And they went back to uh, a place called the Kelly, uh, near Emily, on the Limbic to Prairie border. Now, they must have marched 15 miles overnight. And uh, the following day, the uh, British soldiers raided again. And four more of the IRA were killed. Now, as I say, the IRA in Limbic, uh, in the summer of 1951, was under serious pressure. Uh, the, as I say, in the summer of 1921 also, there were uh, uh, four men from Limbic executed. There was two executed for the part in the rescue of Sean Hogan at Knock Long. There was Patrick Maher and, um, and, and Edward Foley. Um, there was Patrick Casey from from Belly Bricken. He was uh, executed in court for a part, for taking part in the ambush at Strathamma, where uh, a number of IRA had been killed. And the last man to be executed uh, was a fellow called Tom Keane, Captain Tom Keane. He was executed here in Limerick on the uh, 4th of June 1921. Now, the thing about Tom Keane was it was a total tragedy because he had he had been very active and he was caught transferring guns from one unit to another and uh, put on trial. Now there was two other fellows tried with him the same day and they were much more active. Uh, uh, Timmy Murphy and 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 Ned Punch, but for some reason Punch and Murphy were exonerated. Now I do believe that. The British uh, deliberately executed Tom Keane because he was the father of he, he was a married man with a young family, and I believe it had much more of a shock and awe effect rather than executing two single men. Um, as I say, uh, here in Coombe on the twenty-first of May, nineteen twenty-one, the courthouse was burned. Right now. Uh, the IRA, on a number of occasions, made a mistake. They didn't understand petrol. They thought petrol was the same as paraffin oil, and if you threw it on the flames, you know, it would. But what they forgot was that, or didn't know, was petrol as a kind of an explosive. Um, uh, if you throw petrol, you'll get a ball of fire. And in Crew Courthouse, uh, they were using petrol to burn the courthouse, and. The man spraying the uh, uh, they used an knapsack sprayer to spray the petrol out of the building, and when someone threw a match, the man with the knapsack sprayer, the safe was incinerated. Now there was three fellows killed in Chrome, and there was a fourth fellow, Simon Howard, who um, he didn't die straight away, but he died five years later as a young man. So I, I do believe that it did impact him. You know, he had been badly burned at Chrome. <laughs> um, that brings us up to uh, Britain, the IRA couldn't win, but Britain couldn't win either. It was a, a stalemate, effectively. So Britain called a truce, and the truce came into effect on the 11th of June 1921. Now, that's because I'm, I'm going to stop there. Uh, and that went on to the Civil War. <laughs> Anyhow, okay. Oh. Limerick City, yeah, and the mayors were killed. Yes, oh, I forgot that they were killed in in um, March nineteen twenty one by a death squad. It's not not something that happened in recent times. There was a death squad operating, um, uh, certainly in the Limerick area, uh, under a fellow called George Montague Nathan, and um, they raided or they attacked the house of the mayor, uh, who's Shosha Clancy. Now Clancy, uh, some of you will know George Clancy, the referee, the rugby referee. He's his granduncle. Mm -hmm. You know, as I say, the thing is much closer than you think. Uh, Shosha Clancy was the mayor of Limerick in 1921, and um, uh, the ex-mayor was Michael Callaghan. 
and the two of them were shot dead the same night. In addition to a volunteer by the name of Joseph O'Donoghue, who was actually originally from Balnacarkey in County Westmeath. Now, the reason O'Donoghue was shot, people couldn't figure that one out for a long time, but O'Donoghue, uh, as I say, was from Westmeath. Now, Westmeath had a tradition of immigration to the Argentine. Like, there are certain parts of Ireland that Robert Fogarty have the traditionally office. Robert Fogarty, please, the office. For instance, um, uh, Newfoundland uh, would have had a huge uh, immigration from Waterford and Wexford, uh, fishing people. Uh, as I say, uh, uh, Westmeath had this uh, relationship with the Argentine. And uh, Joseph Dunahu was ma managing the River Plate Mead Company in Limerick. They were importing mead from Argentina. Now, British intelligence seemed to think that mead wasn't the only thing he was importing. He was importing guns and ammunition as well. So um, uh, he was shot the same night as the two mayors. Now, he was shot in Jamesboro at about 11 o'clock. And the two mayors were shot about half 12 <coughs> on the other side of the city. Now, it was absolute con connivance because in the case of Clancy, three fellows that shot Clancy had to walk past the Strand Barracks, which was supposed to have sentries out. Right? They went up to Clancy's house up near St. Winston's Church. They shot Clancy. And they came back past the um, uh, Strand Barracks. And no one called them. No one said, halt, or no one said, what are you doing? You know, so as if there was definitely, I would say, connivance. Well, who's your favourite person, Limerick person, during the war? I would say Dunica Hannigan. Right? And I'll tell you why. Now, Dunica Hannigan went free state. But himself and the Malones, now Malones are stars to be Republican, they never fell out. You know, the, the one beauty about Limerick, particularly East Limerick, was fellas took different ways, different sides in the Civil War. But with only one or two exceptions, they didn't fall out. The bit on the wasn't there. Like, one thing you won't find in Limerick. Now, I'm not going to say it was a bit of roses, it wasn't. But what went on in Kerry he said there was killings on both sides. You don't find that in Limerick in the Civil War. And that's because the main characters didn't fall out. You know, they, 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 they once said it was a bit of roses, but uh, the, like for instance, um, Morris Mead, now I, I don't have all day to talk about Morris Mead, but Morris Mead was, dare I say it, uh, uh, character from the War of Independence. He had been, what's what he did? In 1911, he ran away and joined the British Army. By the time the war starts in 1914, he's a lance corporal or a corporal, right? And he's in the Royal Irish Regiment. They were, uh, he was captured at La Basse in 1915. Now, Roger Casement came recruiting to try and get fellas to join him to come back to Ireland and fight in, in 1916. Uh, he had, he had much success, but Morris Mead did join him. So Morris Mead, anyhow, as I say, joined Casement's um, brigade. Right? Um, Casement's brigade was stood down, but didn't have numbers. And the fellows that were, he only recruited 57 men. And the 57 men were given a choice. They could go back into the prisoner of war camp and take their punishment, whatever punishment they, uh, would be meted out to them or they could join the German army. Morris Mead joined the German army and he fought in the Middle East. Now, when he came back to Germany after the war, uh, he was picked up by British intelligence and the rest, and he was brought back to England. And there, uh, there was talks that they were going to execute him, but they didn't. They sent him back to Ireland. And when he went back to Ireland, his regiment, the Royal uh, Irish Regiment, decided they had an issue to, to settle with him. So he was arrested and brought down to Clanmel. Now, the Royal Irish Regiment were based in Clanmel. Their headquarters was in, in, in Clanmel. And Mead had been in that regiment. 
and let's say he was bought back to Tanbel and he was um, uh, being held there. But whether he got the gas drunk, what he did, he escaped out of Tanbel. Now he has only one choice, he has to join the IRA, nobody else wants him. So when he joined the IRA, he was ruthless. You know, now he was very good as a trainer, right? And at the ambush in Drumkeen, it is reckoned that he shot about seven of the eleven that were killed. Certainly, he took two of them up the road and executed them after the ambush. So, when we reported yesterday in fifth year on the treaty, yeah, and it was amazing, wasn't it? He was little taken down the middle, yeah, the uh, treaty. Yeah. And after the Civil War, the cast fit into still to this day, a hundred years later. If you were on the on the treaty, would you have been? And I know you're very fair. You're very objective. Well, you see, I have a thing on the on, on the treaty, right? I think that Dave should have gone with Collins. The two strongest characters must go. I mean, in fairness, if you want a parallel, to be fair, Jerry Adams and Mark McGuinness went together to the Good Friday Agreement. Now. Uh, you can argue, you know, as to what, uh, how much better you could get the thing. But if the two strongest characters fall out, you're being. Now, if Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness had fallen out of the Good Friday Agreement, there wouldn't be a Good Friday Agreement. Now, I do believe that Dave and Collins should have gone together, you know, and get the best deed they could. Now, keep uh, Mulcahy and, um, and, and Lynch. In the loom, Liam Lynch, because Liam Lynch was the, uh, he was the chief of staff of the biggest uh, division in the IRA, first certain division. You know that if, if those fellas had agreed on anything, I don't think there'd be a civil war. Yeah. You know. Any questions, Ed? Craven, any questions? What event was the most misunderstood? Sorry. What event was the most misunderstood of the Irish War of Independence? Why the event is the most misunderstood? Yeah. Um, but the one I think that was ridiculous was the burning of the uh, the, of the uh, custom house. Uh, burning it by day. Why didn't they go in at night? <coughs> it cost the Dublin Brigade eighty men. There was eighty men arrested because they did it in the middle of the uh, 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 of the day. I mean, for God's sake. If they had waited till after dark, they could have gone in and burned the bloody place at their ease. You know, as I say, I know that answers your question, but I think it's the most overrated and ridiculous action of the whole lot. Another question, Antonio? Yeah, Antonio. Yeah. What was the most interesting thing you found about the War of Independence? What was the most interesting thing? Um, I'd say the most interesting thing was the way ordinary people back to the IRA. Mm. You know, that, 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 uh, you see, it is all very well, you're a volunteer, right? And you're in a flying column. And you, you carry out an ambush, right? And you move off. But the people left behind have to face the music. You know, like women now say, are, are you know, older people. They can't, you know, uh, vanish. They have to sit and face the music. You know, and by God, they did. You know, well, the British have burnt up many houses in that situation, Tom. Sorry? The British will have burnt up their houses? They did. Not so much in Limerick. In fact, I would say uh, very few houses burned in Limerick. Now, maybe Lord's house was burned in Le Kelly, but that's on the border of Limerick and Tipperary, right? Um, it would be not few houses, but very few relatively. Like in Clare now. Jesus. And in Clare wasn't that active. But there were a couple of act and there were a couple of significant ambush in, in Clare. And they paid some price afterwards in the number of houses burned. You know, it, and that depended on the officer in charge of the British forces. You know, like there was an officer down in Cork, um, uh, Percival. He was ruthless. 
down in West Cork. He was down in Bendon, right? But when it came in the Second World War, and he was in charge of the British garrison at Singapore, and a much smaller force of Japanese forced him into surrender. When he was dealing with something on his own level, he was not bloody good. I mean, he surrendered uh, 90,000 soldiers at Singapore in, I think, 1940 or 41. So a much smaller Japanese force. Now, as I say, he was the man that was throwing his weight around down in, in, in West Cork, shooting people, uh, executing Ali, you name it. You know, now, as I say, the only people had to stand and face the music. That's the one thing that stands out to me, like, you know, um, you know, that, that, that uh, when you think of Ireland, um, that the ordinary people had to stand up. Well, can I ask you uh, just one last question? Uh, commemoration. Yeah. It's a uh, hot topic, so we will pin this actual for people, etc., or put up plaques and whatever. Um, is there one person from the War of Independence who hasn't been commemorated who you think should be commemorated? Well, I'd say in Limerick, Rob Monteith. Now I say, so who's Robert Monteith? Robert Monteith came in with casement on the submarine with casement in 1916. Now, uh, the public can carry, uh, yeah, how well. Um, he, he, he went in when casement was, wasn't feeling well, and casement went up into the sand dunes at, at Banastrand. Um, Monteith went into Kerry, into Trelly to get, to get help. Now, while he was away, about three or four different people had reported to the RIC. So, Casement was arrested. And um, uh, Monteith knew that, um, uh, you know, he was totally dependent on two people to help him in Kerry. Um, Tom Kellerstrom, a later of Fianna Fáil TD, and a man by the name of Burns, who was McKellstrom's um, brother-in-law. And they took care of him, you know, because the RIC knew that uh, Monteith was in the country, because um, uh, one of the men that came in with them, a fellow called uh, Beverly, had turned uh, informer. So they knew that uh, Monteith was around somewhere, and they were beginning to close in uh, on 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 um, Monteith, right? But they managed to get a priest, I think he was a father of Brosnan, right, uh, to drive Monteith to Raheen. Do you, you know where Raheen is? Raheen Church? As far as Raheen Church. And Monteith went across country, walked across country to Athens in, 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 in um, Ballysimon, Kilonan. And they were raided that night and only for... He, he, he managed to get out of the house into an outhouse where there was a, a, an old workman sleeping. And a policeman came up into the, work, into the outhouse where the workman was sleeping, you see. And Monteith was under the bed. And the policeman didn't have a torch, like nowadays. Right? He had uh, matches on a candle, right? And he's poking under the bed. <laughs> the workman said to him, God's sake, this isn't that bad enough if you leave me all things alone. He was actually poking Monteith with the stick, but he became embarrassed when the, when the workman kind of get, got at him, right? Now, uh, Monteith then would say they realised they're too dangerous to keep him in the house. So they put him in a, an out, in a, a dugout out in the land, and they'd bring him in around six o'clock uh, to get the heat of the fire and get a bead. But he'd have to be gone out of the house by two, two in the morning. Because soon after that, the police would raid. The police raided, you know, in the early morning, early hours of the morning. So, as I say, Monteith was there. Now, as I say, he had to get out of Kerry, Republican Kerry, like a scarlet cat, right? And he was outside in Cologne for six months. The Latin family knew he was there. The workmen knew he was there. Some of their neighbours knew he was there. But the RIC never found out. And he got away to America. Uh, in November 1916. Now, it never, you know, I'm amazed it has never written about. 
somebody's project, but that's definitely those are me. Cool. Last question, bro. Um, which ambush do you think has? Sorry. Which ambush has, do you think has most influence? Oh, without question, Kill Michael. Right, because in fairness to Barry, he took on the auxiliaries. Now it's not black and hands. These are the the elite officers, right? Officer corps. He took on eight of them in a place where you wouldn't expect an ambush, right? And the eighteen of the auxiliaries, uh, sixteen of them were wiped out. One escaped, but he was shot further on, and another one survived. Uh, but the only thing is that three of the IRA attacking party um, were killed. Now, as I say in John Keane, there were 11 RIC men, black and tans, killed, and only Liam Hayes with his um, uh, <laughs> few fingers cut. Um, I had a very funny one about Hayes. Um, he had a sense of humour. Uh, he, when he'd have a few drinks in, he said to his neighbour, now who's a distant cousin, he's Pat Beeson. He said, Pat, if you ever find a few fingers up around your place, he says, they'll, they'll mine. I want them back. Go. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. My absolute pleasure to have Tom. Look, I'd be honest, you could sit here with Tom for five days and you'd never get to the end of him. Uh, he just knows way more. And it's unfortunately in the time we have, we can only really scratch the surface of it, can't we? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, phenomenal stuff. Look, you're never again. Please sit down before you are. You're like you're a mess. Uh, <laughs> Tom, you might come next year again. All right. Yeah? If around. If, yeah. If all around. Uh, do you know what? This is a chance of a lifetime for you to hear someone like this. Uh, it's uh, an encyclopedia. You know, I would say beyond almost human esque at times. Uh, but genuinely, encyclopedia. I would sit down with Tom sometimes and I'd just sit back and just listen away. And you know that. And he'll say stuff and I just listen. That's what you do with Tom, is you listen. Because he knows far, far more than anyone else you've ever met in your lives. Or I've ever met in my lives. In my life. You want to war of independence. Well, I will say one thing, Pat. I'm very lucky in one thing. I was researching this for years, not knowing what I was going to do with it, right? I interviewed people that were alive, you know, that took mm -hmm. part of the thing. But by, I was so slow doing things, right, that by the time, before I was finished, the archives in queue were open. Now, I will say without question, if you are doing research on the Irish War of Independence, and you don't go to queue, you know, to access the archive, to, you only know, don't have the job. This is Q archives in London, that's yeah. Oh. That that, and the irony is I did the archives above Dublin, right? And we'd be dragging we'd be looking dragging stuff out of people, right? You go over the queue, I found the people in queue, activists in queue, that could tell you about the Irish War of Independence, what files are relevant, you know. It amazes me. You know. And as I say, some of these now are English civil servants, but they know that subject. Yeah. We have we don't have history students here in the school town. We have, we have historians. Yeah. So we have you are all historians. Yeah. Could you give them one piece of advice about starting off now being a historian? Just one piece as regards getting information, where to go, or what's the most important thing? I suppose the most important thing is identifying where sources are. You know. Now, as I say, um, do you know old people? You know, and okay, you're not going to know anyone that, that took part in the War of Independence at this stage, because the last man died, uh, he was down in Kerry, what was his name? Keating, Dan Keating, right? He died about 2003. Now, I did know the second last man in the War of Independence, a fellow called Sean Clancy. You know, now he died in 2001. So there's no one to be. You're not going to meet anyone, you know. But you might do. There might be widows. There might still be some widows. See, if a woman uh, who was much younger married, you know, yeah. uh, she might be, there might be. I'm not saying... Or children, is, children will be there still. Yeah. There's children there. You know, as I say, there are definitely people out there that have a knowledge. You know, 
Um, and it surprised you. Like, it, a, a, a story told me by Tommy Fitzpatrick in, in Not Long. Tommy's father had been involved in the rescue of folk and he had been one of the scouts, right? Uh, Bill Fitzpatrick. And Tommy told me, he says, you know, he says, when we were out in the fields walking together, that's when my father used to tell me everything when there was no one else there. He would tell me, you know, he taught me everything, but it was only when we were out uh, walking in the fields together. Now, there are still people out there who have a knowledge. Now, I'm not, you can't have any of this first hand, you know, that was there. But, like, you would have sons and daughters, and you would have possibly widows, even still, like, you know, that, 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 that um, you know. Uh, there's a guy called Tomas Mockenbauer. He's outside in Clare. You might have heard of him. Right? Now, Tomas has done a brilliant job in Clare in collecting the folk memory from old people. Mm. One piece of advice is talk to the old people. Yeah. yeah. Talk to My them. granddad fought in the War of Independence. We were always raging that we didn't sit down properly and talk to him and get write it all down. Mm. Do you know? I think my uncle may have some information written down, but you kind of think about it when it's nearly too late, yeah. you know? You, you see, when you were old enough to have the sense... But I didn't, you see, did. but I was... I'm saying, yeah, when you were old I enough to have the sense, I probably did. Yeah. I, I remember one uh, situation one night. I did remember of Major Theodore Dwyer, right? No, he had taken part mm -hmm. in a number of ambushes. He had been wounded in the war of independence. He was wounded at Cap mm -hmm. right? Now, I used to go up to him every Sunday night, and we'd be sitting down, talking, he'd be explaining things to me. And his son, who had no interest in anything, right, only himself, turned around one day and he said, he was at the fire reading the paper, he says, you know, he says, Daddy's telling you things he never told us. And I felt say, uh, like saying, Frank, if you had an interest, he might. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And again, thanks very much. Thank we you. We'll go back to that. All right, thank you.